What's going on guys, welcome to the show. Today we're talking about some Sega Dreamcast exclusives, as well as a few hidden gems for the system. I love Sonic. I much prefer him over Mario, and when I was growing up, he was my boy. Originally released at launch for the Dreamcast, Sonic Adventure was the first entry in the main series since Sonic and Knuckles. This option would see you take control of up to four characters as you take on the adventure mode that consists of two areas. The adventure field, made up of many events that you encounter throughout the duration of the story in order to advance the plot, whilst completing action stages that become available depending on your progress. One of the most exciting aspects of the game is its story, which is surprisingly strong for a Sonic game and deserves some praise, but it was always going to be an issue moving our beloved blue friend into the realm of 3D. And for the most part, Sonic Team did a great job with the controls, but you still end up slamming into walls which is mainly due to the incredibly annoying camera, which just randomly decides to violently swing around or get stuck on something and there are even parts of the game where the camera just blatantly doesn't work. But where the game fails in one area, it more than makes up for it in another. The amount of variety in this game is astonishing. Sure, you can call it an adventure game, but you'll also find yourself racing around in carts, screaming downhill on snowboards, playing some pinball, and even raising creatures through the Dreamcast VMU. All in all, a great Sonic game that deserves at least a playthrough. Released in 2000 and brought to us by Capcom, Street Fighter 3 Third Strike was the final update to the Street Fighter 3 series, extending the character roster by including 5 new characters into the mix as well as the previous combatants, receiving new stages and endings that continue the plot from where the first two iterations left off. The main change Street Fighter 3 Third Strike brought with it was the way in which throws are performed as well as universal overheads for each character. The single player mode sees you fighting 10 characters which include a character specific rival as well as the game's boss kill. But the most important inclusion is the minigame fans all know and love from Street Fighter 2, and that is the Crusher Car minigame. There really is no better way to get out some frustration between rounds. Street Fighter 3 First Strike is my essential go-to fighter for the system, and if you don't fancy picking it up for the Dreamcast, Capcom released a version for the PS3 and 360 which also included online play. Here's a good drinking game for you. When playing Shenmue, every time Ryo says the word sailor, take a drink. Believe me when I say you'll be fucking fat tricks in no time. You're probably fully aware of how much this series means to me. Shenmue was a deeply personal experience. If I could sum it up in one word, that word would be magical. And no, I'm not trying to sell you something from Apple, but describing Shenmue to someone who potentially has not yet had the chance to play it is really tricky. Released in 1999, Shenmue introduced a new type of gaming, a world in which you are free to pursue what you want. May that be just heading down to the in-game arcade to play some of Sega's classics, spending your time collecting toy capsules, or just exploring the world, which is absolutely absolutely teeming with life. Although not perfect, the game does deliver on its premise, and introduces an epic tale of a young man on a quest to seek his father's murderer. Shenmue raised the bar and showcased what the Dreamcast was capable of. Unfortunately, it would not be enough to turn the Dreamcast fortunes around, but it's gone on to establish an incredible fanbase with nothing but love for the game. F355 Challenge was originally developed for the arcades and later ported to the Dreamcast. What makes this game so special is the inclusion of Yu Suzuki, who directed the game and even went as far to use data from his own Ferrari for the game. Now that's fucking dedication. As many know, Yu Suzuki is the man behind many of Sega's greatest titles, and F355 is no exception. Including over 10 courses for you to race on, the game is considered to be the most accurate simulation of the F355, and the closest peasants like myself would ever get to driving one in real life. The most striking thing about F355 is the game's graphics and it is abundantly clear that a lot of time has been put into the simulation aspect of the game, even down to the inability to change your view whilst driving. This game takes this simulation serious and you'll be wishing you could just pop into a third person view just to take in the game's beauty. Delivered at a solid 60 frames per second, F355 is undeniably a masterpiece. Yu Suzuki set out to deliver a premier Ferrari driving experience and he did just that. Now, Blue Stinger is one of those games that went by largely unnoticed, mainly due to the negative reception it received upon its release, and for good reason. The camera was a mess and the game did feel repetitive at times, but somewhere buried underneath the layers of shit was a game trying to tell a very cool story, and in that aspect it delivered. The game takes many of its cues from Tomb Raider and Resident Evil, and it really feels like the guys over at Climax must have been playing nothing but those games when creating Blue Stinger. Released in 1999, the action survival horror would see you explore 
exploring Dinosaur Island, as you unravel the plot and confront the monsters who have occupied the space. You gain new weapons and items from the various vending machines placed around the world by using coins that are dropped by the game's enemies. As mentioned earlier, the camera can be a bit of a pain, and to make matters worse, the original Japanese release featured a cinematic style camera system that was swapped for the standard third person view. In my opinion, I prefer the original camera system, as I felt it added a lot to the tension and went a long way in helping the game's atmosphere become more engrossing. Also originally developed for the arcades, OutTrigger was brought to the Dreamcast in 2001 and introduced us to one of the system's greatest games. A first and third person shooter, OutTrigger gave you the choice of up to four characters, each with their own specific weapon and attributes. You're pitted against each other set out across a variety of stages where you shall pick up powers that give you an advantage such as the ability to see through walls or weaponry that can turn the tide of a battle like the plasma cannon. What made it so special was the ability to play the game online all at a blistering six 60 frames per second. Back in 2001, Out Trigger really gave Quake an Unreal Tournament a run for their money. But James, you say, you're insane. How could a console shooter hold up to such greatness? Well, Out Trigger includes keyboard and mouse support, which is one of the essential aspects of the experience. If you're gonna pick this one up, I highly suggest investing a bit more in a control scheme, as playing with a controller can become annoying, but not to the point of unplayability. The Last Blade 2 is a port of a Neo Geo 2D fighting game made by SNK. This is nothing like Street Fighter, Marvel vs. Capcom, or any other beat-em-up that hit the Dreamcast. What distinguishes The Last Blade 2 from its contemporaries is the inclusion of weapons and several mechanics such as Repel that works like a counter as well as being given the option to choose a fighting style which include power, speed, and hidden. All of these aspects add up to one of the most enjoyable fighting experiences I've ever had. Announced as SNK's last game for the Dreamcast, it was received well and continues to hold up to this day. One of the best aspects of the game has to be its sound design. Believe it or not, but some of the stages have absolutely no music. Instead, the emphasis is placed on the environmental sounds, such as the wind blowing or houses burning in the background. Sliced with the character's usual sounds really helps to create an ambient atmosphere when playing the game, and in my opinion was a total success. Developed by Genki and released for the system in 2000, Tokyo Extreme Racer 2 improves upon the original in every way and ended up being the most enjoyable racing experience I had on the system. As the title suggests, the game offers you the chance to become a part of the underground extreme racing that takes place in Tokyo. You are allotted a specific amount of funds to buy an old banger and then head out onto the streets. What makes it unique is the ability to just cruise around the highway until your heart's content. But where the game really shines is upon encountering a rival by simply Flashing your headlights of the rival initiates a race right at that moment. And instead of the usual start here, finish there, Tokyo Extreme Racer 2 gives the player an energy meter, and it is this meter that determines the winner. The car behind will have the meter drained slowly, and the first to have the bar emptied loses. By winning races, you receive in game currency to spend on upgrading your vehicle, such as adding parts, new paint jobs, and stickers. The customization is really impressive. And to be honest with you, I just found myself driving around Tokyo and taking everything in at my own pace. It's a surprisingly relaxing practice. The Dreamcast is well known for the amount of amazing fighters that blessed it. This really is a dream console for fighting fans, and with games like Project Justice, it's really hard to argue that fact. Developed by Capcom and released in 2001, Project Justice is a sequel to Rival Schools, which released for the original PlayStation back in 98. Building upon the foundation that made the original so great, Project Justice continues to be a team fighter, but instead of commanding a team of two, the notch is now turned up to three. This allows you to execute devastating party up attacks that see all three characters taking out your opponent. Another aspect carried over from the original is the ability to create your own character, which can then be used in all of the game modes apart from the single player. Also including a pretty robust story mode that offers branching paths for your fighters due to various decisions you are greeted with throughout its duration. There's a hell of a lot to this game and you should definitely give it a go. Many labelled this game as one of the worst Dreamcast games at the time, and it was understandable. I mean, here we had a console with 128 bits of Sega power, and this game kind of looks like it belongs on the PS1. Armada is a top-down view shooter with an RPG-style storyline. It is based on a level-based experience system, and as you blow shit up and clear missions, you get to upgrade your ship as well as a currency system to acquire items to aid you in your quest. The game was originally penned to include a massive multiplayer experience with an endless universe of core 
cooperative online play. But due to the limitations of the Dreamcast network setup, this solution was slashed for a more intimate local multiplayer experience. And taking on this game with up to three other players is a fucking blast. The screen literally litters with enemies and is the perfect game to play when you have your mates around. As like many Dreamcast titles, Cosmic Smash was originally an arcade game that eventually found a home on the Dreamcast. The game is highly influenced by Squash, but instead of facing another player, it is your job to dissolve different shapes by knocking the ball back and forth between yourself and the objects. Each level introduces a different variation of the blocks that all come in exciting shapes and colors. The darker blocks require more force in order to be knocked over, whereas the clear blocks cannot be toppled and act as a barrier. The experience all feels a bit claustrophobic, but that is not something that takes away from the game. The simplistic but vibrant visuals more than make up for the lack of space. The surprisingly deep gameplay rewards anyone who is willing to put the time into learning the game's several mechanics. Whilst the game is incredibly fast, fun and simple, I would say it's best played in short bursts, as it can quickly become repetitive due to the nature of the arcade structure, but still nonetheless a great game for the system you should totally check out. If you're a Capcom fan, you're probably aware of this little gem. Another arcade port, Cannon Spike is a love letter to Capcom fans. You take control as one of six characters with an arsenal of weapons and a set of high-powered motor boots. Bring in six characters from the various franchises that make up the company, Cannon Spike is a multi-directional shooter and is quite similar to Commando, a game released way back in 1985 by Capcom. Becoming increasingly rare to find, the game pits you against enemies across levels and include two areas. In order to progress, you must take them all out as well as a boss that appears at the end of each. This game is literally about shooting the fuck out of everything on the screen. Do not go in expecting anything more or less. The only aspect I would say where the game fails is not including any extras from the arcade port. This is basically a no frills port and as a consequence feels quite short, but with the game being so much fun, it is quite easy to overlook this aspect. Well, that was it, guys. Thanks for taking the time to check the video out. If there are any exclusives or hidden gems that I missed for the Dreamcast, let me know in that comment box below and we'll include them in part two. See you next time.